Greetings, Zero Books readers. I'm delighted to bring to you this conversation today with the award-winning author, Alvio Wilk, on her latest book, Death by Landscape. The book borrows its title from a short story by Margaret Atwood, in which an elderly woman reminisces about her childhood friend who mysteriously disappeared during a camping trip. Despite her friend's disappearance, the woman grows suspicious that she lives on in the paintings adorning the walls of her Toronto condominium. Wilkes' Death by Landscape is an impressive theoretical accomplishment, seamlessly joining together discussions of environmental crisis, science fiction, eroticism, sexuality, mysticism, and so much more. Elvia, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. So I just wanted to start off this conversation by asking a little bit about yourself. What is it that, what is your background as a writer? What brought you to this strange, strange profession? And what led to the creation of this book? I'll try to keep it succinct. It's a wine and pat. I was an art writer for many years and also an architecture writer working for magazines. And then at some point in the mid 2010s, I wrote a novel out of nowhere. And that novel was drawing a lot on speculative architectures and I guess like the urbanizing creative class of Berlin where I was living. So it was a different kind of reflection on some of the stuff I had been writing about in criticism. And uh, yeah, I guess I, I have always written essays and over time I gathered a body of work that seemed to make sense as a book, but in the process of compiling a book, I ended up writing a new book <laughs> instead of, instead of anthologizing old work. There is a lot of recycled and mutated material from, you know, many, many years of writing in this book, but Death by Landscape is, is a cohesive, I hope it's a cohesive project with some kind of connective tissue and a narrative arc. And the essays, while they are kind of separated thematically into three sections, they refer kind of like tonally to each other in a lot of ways. Now, I have some ideas about what I think the key themes of the book are, but I'm curious to start off with how you would summarize it. Obviously it's divided into these three sections, plants, planet, and blood. I believe those were the three. Bleed. What drew you to bleed, sorry. What was it that <laughs> towards these three themes in particular? And what would you say are like the key or core messages of the book? If that's even a meaningful question to ask in the context of it. Oh, I certainly can't do the elevator pitch for this one. I've never been able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but judging by the cover copy, I can tell you what it's about. The three sections are pretty loose. Plants is about ecosystems and about this idea I have about ecosystems fiction or a kind of storytelling that takes into account humans, non-humans, all sorts of complicated, interrelated, interdependent systems rather than a kind of single protagonist against the backdrop of the world, which is a traditional way that Western books and other kinds of stories are structured. And I take plants as my motif to move through some bizarre interspecies transformations. So stories about women becoming plants, stories about women inhaling fungal spores and becoming unreliable witnesses, stories about plant ESP and people communicating empathically with plants. So this kind of sets up a theoretical framework, thinking about human, non-human interactions in an expanded sense. And also that's where mysticism comes in, kind of ideas of the divine as a ultimate non-human entity. Plan planets is about apocalypses and utopias and dystopias and about scale. So like reckoning with the size of the individual in relation to the world, the universe. And I guess I'm trying to uncouple the utopia dystopia binary and I get into genre fiction. I get into the aesthetics of kind of political fiction. And then in the final chapter, Bleed, I sort of bring myself into the story really explicitly. And it's a about sort of, I guess, the boundaries, my, my own boundaries becoming challenged through works of art, works of literature, role-playing games, and kind of encounters that I've had that have changed the way that I conceive the world. And then there's an epilogue where I reflect very explicitly and in a pretty intimate way on my experience writing a, a book during the pandemic, which changed my idea of work and the future. So something I noticed while reading through it, I mean, Obviously, totally unsurprisingly, this doesn't read like one of these tired, scholastic, academic textbooks. Uh, and that's Thank very you. much a good thing. <laughs> okay. uh, it's not like 
I don't know, reading Bertrand Russell or some sort of formal logic where everything is set out in premise conclusion form. But the more I thought about this in the context of actually reading it and kind of thinking of how the form your book has taken corresponds to the contents, the more it sort of occurred to me how interesting this is as an exploration of a distinction between sort of utopian perspectives and, and perspectives which are kind of dislocated. I would say that this anthology, rather than as I would usually describe the more scholastic academic works, having a kind of maybe utopia and even distant perspective from what it's writing about, rather than trying to do that, tries to look at things slightly awry in a, in a dislocated way instead. Would you say that's accurate? Or if you could expand upon the utopian dislocated distinction? Sure. That totally sounds accurate. I think I don't pretend any kind of objective distance from my material. And that's why the book is structured in the way that it's structured as sort of beginning with what might seem like literary criticism or might seem kind of like, you know, theoretical work starts a little more academic at the beginning. And, and by the end, I've just clearly arrived on the scene and I'm presenting myself as a character in this story. And that setup was important to me because I wanted, I wanted the reader to have the experience of encountering my subjectivity sort of like in a, in a complicated way where it's not always clear my relationship to the material, but it's clear that I'm really wrapped up in it. Not that academic books necessarily deal in objective stances. I think the best ones certainly don't, but there is sort of like a formal bias towards a posture of a universal subject or I guess a third eye, <laughs> I guess you could say, or a third person. And in terms of, yeah, I guess, I guess I would also agree that, that the book is, is dislocated both from genre and a certain formal methodology in the same way that this fiction that I talk about as dislocative maybe does. Omar el is a novelist. And in the, in this book, I talk about his novel, American War which is a kind of wild inversion of the story of the American Civil War far in the future when the American South has rebelled against the North for fossil fuel injunctions, basically. So there's re political repression under the guise of sustainability. And I find this to be a really important parable because it allows us to see the way that different, you know, political agendas and ethical messages and ideas of utopia totally defeat each other <laughs> and, and sort of like this utopian ideal of a green economy in this case is actually an incredibly violent one. And Ella Codd has used this term dislocative fiction to describe his own fiction and that rather than taking the default protagonist to be the Western white individual who's narrating the story of the world from a position of default power, the story is simply dislocated from that frame and we see what's already always happening somewhere else, but it appears as science fiction because the default, I guess, white male writer or reader is not familiar with it. So it appears to be totally radical science fiction. Anyway, I think dislocative is a better word than a lot of other words to describe this type of writing that, as you say, looks askance at reality. And in my own fiction, when talking about my own fiction, I usually call it reality adjacent instead of forward looking or predictive or something like that. So this idea of providing solutions or providing roadmaps is not something I'm interested in. And I guess that's also some way that I would distance myself from more prescriptive types of academic writing. I think that brings us perfectly onto one of the things I noticed was a recurring theme over the course of this book. It seems like one of the main questions that you try to deal with consistently is what the role of fiction is in making sense of these sort of larger scale issues. I think later on, you describe it as sort of the slow violence, the sorts of things that usually occur over the duration of multiple lifetimes rather than a single one, or maybe things which harm human life at a planetary scale rather than the scale of an individual human life. How well do you think fiction can actually help us to represent these things that lie outside of or transcend the limits of human thought or representation or maybe even language? I think it can do a lot. I will always give the caveat that I don't think fiction is going to solve climate change. I don't think writing novels is going to intervene into systems of power in the same way that other kinds of struggle might. But I do certainly want to make a case for fiction being able to 
intervene in other ways. And those might be interventions of perception, where, as you say, the reader might encounter the limits of knowability or question the individual relationship to the planetary. There's been a lot of writing and discussion, and I, I guess the best known would be the writer Amitabh Ghosh, who wrote a book called The Great Derangement a few years ago, where he laments how the classic individual moral adventure tale of the you know heroic narrator completely fails us when it comes to dealing with climate change because it doesn't show how systems interconnect. And it suggests that one individual is in some visible or tangible way responsible for or can control any of these systems, which is, of course, not the case. I and others have pointed out that Gosh doesn't read a lot of science fiction or genre fiction and that genre fiction probably has been doing that pretty well for a long time. So I'm often looking at the fringes of like what might be called like canonical mainstream fiction. But I do think like, especially as the term cli-fi has like risen to prominence for better or for worse, we can totally see like a wide swath of contemporary mainstream literary fiction really tackling the issues of scale and responsibility and contingency and causality that come with planetary crisis. Mm -hmm. And then in conjunction with Clive 5, it seemed like your discussion of maybe the imaginative potentials of fiction reaches this really fascinating apogee as you talk about solar punk. What was it that led you towards this strange, small political aesthetic phenomenon? And what do you think its significance is? Well, a friend told me that the novel I had written was very solar punk. And I was like, that sounds great. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> that was like back in 2014 or something. And I don't know, 2016. And I was sort of like captivated by this concept. It's a born digital movement, which means it kind of arose in message boards and tumblers and stuff as a set of loose and totally heterogeneous discussions about basically like, how could we like make an aesthetics for a sustainable future that wouldn't look like Apple headquarters and that, you know, might lean utopian, but not be kind of like starry eyed and night, which is complicated. And so in that essay, future looks in the middle of the book, I kind of try to pick apart the strands of like what it means to attach an, an aesthetic to a political narrative before the political narrative is even formed. So of course it sits in the lineage of cyberpunk and before that steampunk genres I love and I'm interested in. And I think it's quite fascinating that each of these punk genres has an energy substrate. So steampunk was the coal era, cyberpunk was the oil era, solar punk is clearly the solar future, supposedly. That sets up our chronology that, it, you know, of course, that's not how history has moved. It's not like we've moved from one to the other, but the attendant aesthetics of each of those genres certainly has to do with the, you know, I guess like extractive fuel sources <laughs> that are associated with the time, whether the time that they're written in or the time that, that they're fetishizing and writing about. And I always get really tangential and lost when I talk about solar punk because there's so much good stuff there. <laughs> but walk away. I, I think it's all great <laughs> stuff. <laughs> well, so that's the essay where I get into the idea of dislocative fiction that kind of rather than looking towards the future or kind of making proposals or solutions or top-down plans, which I think is the real problem with utopian fiction is simply that it's a unilateral plan a lot of the time and that we all know utopias are only interesting insofar as they devolve into dystopias. <laughs> That's where the fun comes in. But, but yeah, I was just, I was thinking, you know, so rather than propositions, we could just talk about shifting the frame of reference and dislocating the now. And the future is bleak. The future is murky. It's hard to work with kind of future-oriented progress in the way that steampunk did and then cyberpunk undermined. The future is, it doesn't belong to most of us, I guess. And so I have a real time, a real hard time thinking in terms of futurity. So I'm thinking in terms of spatial dislocation instead. Mm -hmm. Well, in the context of the whole discussion of various kinds of punk, there was one that was sticking in the back of my mind, which you didn't bring up, which is, of course, diesel punk. I uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe the smallest of all of them, apart from maybe like biopunk or something like that. I uh, think it's, it's in a parenthetical somewhere. There's even okay. cattle, cattle punk in there. And all right. Very <laughs> but I was wondering what you make of diesel punk's politics specifically, because I think it has an interesting way also of dealing with a lot of the problems that you try to confront in this book. That is, how do we think utopia without just placing it at a distance? How do we think utopia without giving appropriate recognition to its underside, the, the existence of 
an unevenly distributed dystopia out of the midst of which a utopia can seemingly arise in only some places. You use the example of Elysium, Matt Damon. But it seems like in Diesel Punk, and the two main examples that I think of for it are like The Man in the High Castle and Wolfenstein, it seems to play with the laws of a world in which war and destruction are a fact, which has irre irreversibly scarred our societies and technologies, mm -hmm. uh, but in which some sort of hope lingers on the horizon. It's usually confessedly cashed out in the terms of like the overcoming of a Nazi menace. But I, I think the message is maybe a little bit more universal than that. I didn't know expert on diesel punk. And I also, I mean, these categories get fun, funny and, and ridiculous when we get too fine grained, but I love it. The Man in the High Castle is kind of, a, it's like a counterfactual proposition. And I, f I feel like counterfactuals are actually a really good way of thinking about dislocation it is like also like counterfactuals are in some sense of like a formal exercise which i think is interesting but i guess is your question about like the relation like the actual energy politics of diesel punk or about the aesthetics i guess of well it seems like solar punk is primarily occupied with imagining what a different future could look like <laughs> one in which we don't ruthlessly exploit our resources, in which we aren't plummeting towards some sort of grand global catastrophe. Um, that's how I, at least in the context of your discussion of it, think of solar punk. It's a way of imagining a new future uh, in opposition to, of course, what Mark Fisher is always going to talk about, Pache Berardi, the slow cancellation of the future. Well, the response there is to try and have some hope, to try and start thinking about the future again in a way that just isn't, isn't just more of the same. Mm -hmm. But solar punk seems to do this by looking from the future backwards, by saying, mm -hmm. this is the utopia that we want, this is what we're aiming for. And it's a lot better than any of the other futures we're thinking about so far. Mm -hmm. But diesel punk seems to begin from the point of a world in which war and destruction are already entrenched, in which things mm -hmm. are deeply unequal. I'm looking forward to maybe a solar punk reality. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the criticism of solar punk, which I and many have made, which I think is totally valid, is that it's, I guess, it's too easy, <laughs> right? And then for me, the the questionable aspect of it is really that its aesthetic reference points are in like Art Nouveau and Art Deco and kind of like neo-Victorianism, kind of similar to some steampunk references. And to me, that suggests like, uh-oh, like we're in a retrograde aesthetic and we're kind of like, it's almost impossible to imagine importing the aesthetic of the Victorian era without its attendant morality. So I, I guess like, like I feel like solar punk is like so charming and so hopeful and so refreshing. And at the same time, I think it's, it, it hasn't really found a cohesive narrative to undergird those aesthetics. And I don't think that the aesthetic choices are actually like indicative of like stained glass solar panels is the kind of classic example. And, you know, it, there is something to be said for making sustainability nice, pretty, sexy, fun, whatever, but, but that's certainly not enough. And, and I guess one thing, the thing that, that is probably more useful about it is that it, it like some, some parts of the solar punk universe are really interested in practicality. So it's not a fantasy of time travel or like, you know, pre-made steampunk goggles or like, you know, it, it's really about like, what skills do we need to learn? Do we need to learn like permaculturing? Do we need to learn like certain systems of water purification? Like what actually would we need to do? Like, what are these extreme practical steps that we would need to make? And that to me is a utopian impulse, much more than the shiny green future of like, you know, car cities without cars and, and beautiful trees and stained glass solar panels. Mm -hmm. And I guess a lot of the instances of that kind of contemporary preparation for a solar punk future, it's interesting to note that a lot of it seems to just happen outside of, outside of the constraints of the law. Mm -hmm. Something that I and a lot of friends talk about, I, I, one day I aspired to do it is guerrilla gardening, where you kind of go into an urban space and just take it over and make it into something like a community garden. It, we have like, a great one in the neighborhood that I live in. They've been re relocated twice now, I think, as the developers keep driving them out, but they has been involved in some of that. <laughs> well, it seems like these sorts of preparations for a solar pump future, if I can say that, at least as they manifest today, seem to be outside the limits of the law, or at least outside of the limits of homogenous mass culture, it, it tends to be, as you have it, punk. But I guess I'm, I'm curious about a phrase that you use in the same essay. You talk about changing science fiction into science action. And this brings us right back to one of the questions with which we began, 
which is how do we actually move from kind of fictional imaginings of a better world to the realization of such a world, to the oppositions of the reality in which we live, in which there's a woeful abundance of unfairness and inequality. The science fiction and decides action is kind of tongue in cheek. It's a joke with myself. It's borrowed from some corporate slogan about like a, <laughs> like a, like a biotech slogan where their idea is certainly that like the future is here, you know, <laughs> we're, we're forging solutions. And I find that it's a, it's an interesting idea. It cuts both ways because science fiction does turn to science action. There's plenty of historical examples. Arthur C. Clarke is the most cited. He literally invented geostationary satellites. Like he drew them, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and, you know, William Gibson and cyberspace. And, you know, we could talk about, there are all sorts of relationships of between like prediction and plan and co-optation. And I guess like I would argue against evaluating fiction according to how well it can predict reality or insert real futuristic mechanisms into reality via corporate or scientific co-op. But I am really interested in those hyperstitional loops where fiction has these odd repercussions outside of itself in different fields. And at the same time, I'm hyper aware that you can't write a fiction today without the very real possibility that someone will read it, take the ideas and use them for profit and completely pave over the intentional criticality that may have been written in. So there's another aesthetic that you touch upon in the book that I also like to consider briefly. We've spoken about the solar punk, but the first third of the book, if I can put it this way, is sort of a prolonged meditation on what you also term the botanical gothic. I mean, I'm dressed in all black. That sort of stuff just makes me go crazy. But <laughs> what, what do you understand by the botanical Gothic and what is its significance? Well, the term comes to me from a book called Evil Roots. That's an edited anthology by a woman called Daisy Butcher. Incredible name. And I wasn't aware that there was a genre called the botanical Gothic. And I'm not sure anyone was aware until this anthology was put out by the British Library a couple of years ago. But it's there's just so much that fits into it. Stories about man-eating plants, stories about colonial jungles with terrifying strangling vines, stories about sailors being overtaken by sea moss. Like there was just a total obsessive fascination in in Gothic fiction and and I guess like you know, Victorian fiction and, you know, even up until like, I mean, you can kind of continue, like I was just reading some like 50s sci-fi and I was like, this is pretty botanical gothic too. But the threat of the non-human other returning to take its due is built into this kind of fantasy world. But it is really strange, a lot of it. A lot of it doesn't quite accord with some of the other, you know, like human versus animal sort of like, or like human versus technology, human versus machine narratives that we are so familiar with because plants are so other. And so I guess their communication is so different than ours. And they're also, they're easy stand-ins for colonial subjects because they are thought of as passive and as resources for extraction. So a lot of this genre is just kind of like really blatant colonial fable told from the perspective of the colonizer, but oddly it often turns on itself and sort of like transmits the opposite moral message that it intends to. If I'm not mistaken, it's sort of in the same context of your discussion of maybe why it is that plants tend to make such compelling villains and horror and so on, that you also have this interesting discussion of something like a sexualization of nature. And you talk a little bit about Edelman's concept of reproductive futurism. I was wondering if you could say something about how your discussion of the botanical Gothic ties into your discussion of queer oppositionality and the kind of naturalization of, of sexuality, if you can put it that way. Yeah, I mean, I will point out these are distinct essays. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to, I don't want to suggest that this is all cohesive. But in the essay that the second one you're referencing is called This Compost, The Erotics of Rot. And in it, I am dealing with this kind of idea of like, what if sexuality was distributed beyond the human or at least like an erotic and libidinal energy, which requires a reconception of the idea of reproduction, right? Like if reproduction is not just reproducing human life and reproduction is not the telos of human life or even of, of other species lives, then we could think of ourselves as reproducing the atmosphere. We could think of ourselves as reproducing ecosystems. 
we could think of ourselves as reproducing life by shitting, breathing, or making compost in the garden. And I think this kind of like ecologically distributed idea of reproduction sort of like allows me to have a conversation with queer theorists like Edelman or people who ad advocate alternate family structures or, you know, different kinds of material and social reproduction where I see an opportunity for political antagonism to come in in this, this questioning of kind of like single species reproduction. And that I also kind of like, well, that essay is also really expansive, but there's like, uh, there's quite a bit about the idea of self-enclosure and like the bodily boundaries that were created with the invention of the human during the enlightenment and then the enclosures surrounding nature that happened at the onset of capitalism and that these kinds of enclosures are like, you know, in strict boundary rules could be transcended or questioned if we stop thinking in species terms. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an important challenge to pose to even just the ways in which we have historically as a species thought about utopia. Maybe another dimension of it is that what we sometimes think of as an ideal society tends to just be a, a kind of purification or reflection of what already exists. The example that immediately comes to mind is Thomas More's Utopia. Now, it maybe has a lot of good ideas in it, like collective ownership of the means of production, but... <laughs> What, what grounds the whole society that he discusses is a kind of extremely strict and dogmatic isolation of the family form, which becomes inescapable, such yeah. that divorce is almost impossible to attain. You have this horrible ritual where you, you're sort of stripped by an angry nurse before your lover. And yeah, I think this discussion of, of sexuality and of utopia beyond the historical constraints imposed upon them maybe even just by the demands of political economy. One thinks of Malthus and the introduction of human reproduction into like economic thinking. A lot of this seems like a really good way of getting out of that trend and thinking of utopia anew in a way that just yeah. doesn't reproduce the oppressions of the family or any of these other things. Yeah, I guess my suggestion is that, you know, utopias, yeah, the, historically, I guess, require groups of individuals and require this, I guess, they require homogeneity historically, the original version of utopia. And it is, if everyone's going to have equal rights, everyone's going to be the same, if, you know, and, and this kind of like terrifying uniformity that spun out of a lot of utopian vision. I guess I'm saying, you know, at this point, a utopia would look like, uh, for humans, would look like one in which the divisions and boundaries and hierarchies within the category of humanity are dissolved. But I'm saying that in order to do that, we probably need to also restructure the divisions and categories and hierarchies outside of the category humanity, thinking about nature, thinking about machines, thinking about all sorts of non-human entities like rocks and rivers. Let's move on to another what I another one of what I think are the really central themes of this book. If I was to say you know, in a, in a single sentence to like get someone to read this. <laughs> but <laughs> Please I think do. Out of it, what I'd say is a really detailed and really fascinating understanding of what it means to be not just a person, but a body living through the end times. <laughs> that is, what does it mean to be a human being with our, as you put it yourself, leaky bodies living through a period of environmental catastrophe and mass institutional injustice? So what would yeah. you... <laughs> What would you have to say about what your book contributes to our understanding of this? Of oh, I don't have the human being. A, a finite being with limits and needs in a world that's slowly falling apart around us. Yeah, I mean, I do not have the hubris to suggest that there's a contribution being made, but but I am constantly arguing for the permeability of the individual and constantly arguing for an understanding of the human being as an already always already interspecies and symbiotic and imbricated in, in ecosystems that are beyond our grasp, but that we are not incidental to. And that's extremely confusing, right? The idea that I have no control over what's happening to the planetary, but that I somehow matter to it and that it somehow will affect me and that those relations will be violent. Like that's incredibly hard to reconcile. And I think I constantly want to zoom in and think about the way that we are all always existing in small ecosystems as well as big ones. And that zooming in is like often the only palatable way to think about futurity. And I do think on the level of physical bodily transformation, I mean, one reason I am in love with medieval mystics is that they are undergoing these total 
self-annihilating experiences of surrendering themselves, their egos, their bodies, their conscious will, all of it is being surrendered to a divine force. When you can see mystical encounters happening all the time that aren't framed in the rubric of religion, encounters with the natural world, sub the sublime, the technological sublime, encounters with art, encounters with beauty, encounters with love. And, and I find it important that those kinds of, you know, like hyper object encounters to borrow an overused and problematic term, <laughs> like the, the, the hyper object encounter is physical, you know, and, and it does something to you. And, and I think that the ability to understand that we are constantly physically affected by our surroundings is actually, it, 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 there's something utopian about it. It seems like in the context of that and, and your interest in sort of mysticism also as a mode of opposition to theology. Both of these being historical stand-ins for a domain of grounded experience that articulates itself in the language of the body. Well, theology seems to be this kind of domain of pure abstract reason that imagines it can deduce the principles of reality from a comfortable armchair. And there's this great line that you use early on where you compare I think, the new weird to science fiction as a mysticism as to theology. If I'm getting that right. Could you that possibly expand right. on what you mean by that? Yeah, well, so the new weird is a genre the and, and anti-genre that I talk about pretty extensively at the beginning of the book, which is a genre that I'm interested in because it doesn't quite accord with the conventions of science fiction or of fantasy. And it's no law, it's not, you know, technologically probable. It's not really worried with pl about plausibility or sticking with the laws of the universe, but neither is it kind of like absconding with the idea of reality or solving everything through in magical inventions. And New Weird has a tendency to be interested in the ways that humans and non-humans interact. And I think it, it offers a lot of potential for ecological fiction and climate fiction. And so anyway, so the, I, I'm, I'm, I'm posing it next to science fiction and saying that Yes, making the comparis comparison between science fiction and theology and new weird and mysticism. I think that new weird is about encountering the unknown and the unknowable beyond categories of reason or rationality. Like theology, science fiction is generally beholden to ideas of cause and effect and ideas of, you know, gravity, <laughs> like, you know, like physical laws and yeah and does often take a stance of of objective detachment although it's hard to say that always i'm a huge fan of science fiction and theology they're just doing different work than i would say mysticism and new weird are doing which is deep and physical reckoning with the great non-human other but it seems like the way that mysticism usually expresses itself is in the language of the apophatic I think you have a great discussion of this fairly early on. The apophatic just being that which can more or less only be expressed negatively uh, mm -hmm. in apophatic theology or, or maybe a bit called apophatic mysticism. It, it relates itself to a God that can only be described negatively. God is not uh, a finite being like us. God does not love like we do and so on. I think for a lot of things that it can be really important to try and limit ourselves to an apophatic understanding and description of them. But in the context of, say, climate fiction, I almost wonder if a different approach is important, one that really does point the finger and name names <laughs> and refuse to limit itself to what could be felt rather than said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, I guess in mysticism, there are two traditions. One is the apophatic, the negation of the negation, and the other is the cataphatic, the accumulating assertions. So rather than God is the absence of all things, God is the ultimate light. and and the piling and piling and piling of assertions versus the taking, taking, taking away of assertions. And both of those are ways of reaching the ultimate, yeah, nothingness or everythingness. But I totally agree with you that when it comes to, you know, like concretely dealing with climate change, like neither the apostatic or the cataphatic is really like <laughs> a, a political strategy. But I do think those modes of encounter are valuable in order to understand or feel ourselves as parts of ecosystems. But no, at no point would I blame all of humanity for climate change. There are like 10 people who are really on the hook right now. And I'm pretty clear that Jeff Bezos's utopia is not the same as my utopia, is not the same as utopia for, you know, bats or raccoons <laughs> or, you know, the invasive species of moth that's taking over New York City. Mm -hmm. 
Well, speaking of the contrast between maybe the kind of utopia that you and I would subscribe to and that to which that which someone like Jeff Bezos probably has in mind, I'm sure that the recent movie, Don't Look Up, will not have passed you by. I didn't watch it. I really couldn't. I'm uh, sorry. It's so relevant to your book. But no. It's been very, very controversial. And maybe that's one for another time then. No, it's all right. I mean, I've read as much as possible about it. I just couldn't bring myself to watch it. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about alarmism. We can talk about trying to come up with like really reductive metaphors and apocalyptic visions for things that are systemic and slow in nature. In the book, I talk about Lars von Trier's movie Melancholia, which is certainly more interesting than Don't Look Up and has a yes. lot more Freudian shit going on, but similarly has the fantasy of, a, you know, outer space catastrophe destroying everything and the emergency that that creates is the premise for action or in the case of melancholia total inaction and i guess the inaction is a more interesting plot point to me than i mean i guess in don't look up there's also inaction but there is this like alarmism from what i understand of the movie that is only possible because there is like a this physical single single threat and that singular nature of threat is just so counter to ideas of systemic reformation or abolition I'm interested in why you think it's the case that something which has a nuanced and appropriate response to climate catastrophe, something like melancholia, passed relatively under the radar, as opposed to something like Don't Look Up, which received mass coverage and had all of these big name actors. I mean, of course, melancholia has Kirsten Dunst. It's Kirsten Dunst, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it came out like 10 years ago. And at the time, I remember it being a big deal, but I also know that Lars von Trier was shortly thereafter canceled, so that might have had something to do with it. Ah, uh, I didn't know about that. One. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it was on press tour for Melancholia. He said some like Hitler comment that wasn't taken well by the audience. But he's a particular case. I mean, we, I, we could talk a lot about Lars von Trier and his ways of dealing with violence. I don't know. Maybe that's also for another time. Well, that's kind of what I was hoping to pursue here. But uh, thank you for the. The upfront warning, because I, I was asking you about kind of the politics of, of an apophatic theology or an apophatic mysticism. And it occurred to me, one of the people that you have, again, a really interesting discussion of is Simone Weil. And she's someone who I think might function as some sort of falsifier to this depoliticization of, of apophatic theology. You know, yeah. Sort of, well, apophatic theology normally contents itself to talk about the, the the great unknown being or God only in terms of what it's not. It seems like Simone Weil's refusal to speak and also refusal to eat less than an escape from the reality that apophatic theology usually turns its gaze away from. It's her attempt mm -hmm. to immerse herself in it. Of course, after mm -hmm. her second mystical experience uh, at a, a fishing village in Spain, she reports having thought or having finally realized that Christianity is the religion of the slaves. And that if you wanted to understand what it's like to be a working person, if you want to understand what it's like to be afflicted, the thing to do is to delve really deeply into mysticism. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, she's a fantastic case study for thinking about the relationship between mysticism and politics because, and there are lots of sort of women characters in that essay, characters meaning historical figures whose biographies may or may not be constructed, but who are... Uh, there's a constant tension between reclusion and participation and throughout the history of Christian mystics, especially, but m mystics of, of all religions, there is a choice to be made about the whether to participate or whether to withdraw and whether in withdrawal, there is its own kind of incredible political power in withdrawing from a system or withdrawing from a, po a body politic. And then often what happens in the narrative is like the person who withdraws then returns and has brought some kind of wisdom or people seek out this person who has withdrawn for some kind of like yeah, knowledge transfer. But yeah, in the case of Simone Bay, I guess she, she like, I really like this line that Chris Krauss uses to describe her in Aliens and Anorexia, where she says, like, people thought it was impossible for a woman to destroy herself as a political act or something. That's a paraphrase. But this idea of, of the destruction of the self seeming like, seeming, seeming like a reclusive and an apolitical gesture, when in fact it is like the 
you know, she had the heart that beat round the world or, or something. I, I don't know. Simone de Beauvoir said that maybe. This, this kind of like radical empathy that is so great and so un unbearable that the body, of like at the level of the self, the body disintegrates or, you know, becomes untenable. And I do think the fact that this like political encounter is not just represented in Simone Weil's body, but it's actually it's taking place within her body. There is something to be said about how, yeah, women as political actors have the sight of the body to act on in a way that sometimes that is their only site of action. And yeah, I suppose this like self-abnegation is like a super ancient mystical tactic and a way of reaching beyond the self. And I, I do sort of arrive at some kind of idea that to deconstruct or annihilate the self is also a way of deconstructing or annihilating species being as such or, you know, a bounded category of humanity. You spend a fair bit, maybe towards the middle of the book, talking again specifically about the historical role of female mystics, not only opposed to theology, but also as opposed to like masculine mysticism or male mystics. But there's always this worry in these kinds of discussions that one might end up endorsing, whether implicitly or explicitly, some kind of gendered essentialism. I know that this is a worry that you're very open to. So how do you think it is that the way in which a lot of these female mystics navigate their own bodily understandings of, of religion, of suffering and politics, that manages to escape essentialism? Yeah, it's a great question. And I do think about it a lot. And I agree that I'm pretty explicit about wanting to get past that in the book. And part of it is simply that when talking about medieval figures, gender was operating totally differently. It's just like really important to emphasize that Jesus was like a complicated gender figure. He was penetrated. He was envisioned as having milk leaking from his wounds. All of his wounds look like vaginas. Like there's the central figure is so complex in, in, in terms of the way his body is sexed and gendered. And of course, he is also a spirit body and a divine body. And, and you know, he's like a non-human, non-gendered body. So I really am super like adamant that we don't map gender binaries on figures from like, you know, early modern or pre-modern times, even though it's clear that social roles were distinct and that female mystics were dealing with body-based stuff because of a specific set of constraints that they're up they were operating with, that their lives were not necessarily so open as those gendered men at the time. But it's also worth mentioning, like, there are tons of, like, really interesting stories about, like, trans monks and, like, eunuchs who turned out to be women. There's this great book I read on, like, I can't remember what it's called, like, gender Byzantium or something. Like, so, like, the <laughs> Like Byzantium was just like wild when it came to like gender bending stuff. And yeah, I kind of want to carry that, that just understanding of like the historical specificity of essentialism and be clear, I guess, also when I'm talking about like, you know, contemporary fictions that deal with like women becoming trees. This is not about naturalizing women or saying that women are closer to nature. The point is to say everybody is permeable. Everybody, everybody is a god holes. Everybody can reproduce if we think about reproduction in an expanded sense. It's simply that non-males or people who have been excluded from the category of males and usually white males have, you know, historically <laughs> centuries and centuries of practice of ways of subsuming themselves, of radically imagining themselves into the lives of others, of becoming, I guess, I guess like the kind of radical empathy that we're talking about with Simone Bay. And I guess... She's a figure that exemplifies really well what you've been talking about there. I mean, I remember for a long time, she refused to sign off her letter to her family as Simone. She would cut off the E and call herself Simon. Mm -hmm. And for a little while, she went under the anagram of Emil Novis. Oh, cool. Or, I didn't know that. Emil being both, being at least gender ambiguous in the original yeah. French. She would always wear clothing that disguised her body, for which she gained the, the, the nickname, the Martian, which her teacher is actually called <laughs> And you know, Joan, of, Joan of Arc was also a cross-dresser. Oh, right. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Another notorious mystic who was not at all interested in presenting as femme. I guess I'd like to talk a little bit more then about the, the specific dynamic that goes into politicizing suffering. Because again, I think that that's another one of the key themes of your book that maybe you go into a little bit more in the final section, especially where you talk about this distinction between becoming desensitized to trauma or desensitized to hate 
or learning to integrate it and reconcile with it. You have this great discussion, which seems to conclude, if I'm understanding it right, with the claim that this distinction isn't just a psychiatric one. It's also a very, very important political distinction mm -hmm. because by learning to integrate our own trauma rather than becoming desensitized to it, we seem to learn how to be open to the trauma of others. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. In the last section, I have an essay about virtual reality experiments conducted by humanitarian organizations who are trying to put the user of the VR headset into the position of somebody who is suffering, usually like a child in Syria who's experiencing a bombing or something, you know, like a kind of really classic, like suffering other subject, refugee subject is kind of consistently appears in these films. There's like Holocaust stuff, like really like intense trauma porn. But there are a lot of interesting questions about what this says about the way that we think empathy works. Like, you know, do we think that empathy can only be triggered by instigating trauma? Why do we have so much emotional currency attached to this idea of secondhand trauma or the fact that you have to prove or give testimony that you were able to experience the trauma of another? And then of course, like thinking about, I use some classic Sontag in that essay where regarding the pain of others, in, in regarding the pain of others or whatever it's called, she, she has this passage that's often cited as sort of an argument against exposure of images of suffering people because people will become desensitized. But what she's actually saying is that it is intolerable to have your suffering twinned with the suffering of others. It flattens all experience into one kind of suffering when in fact a Empathy requires that we understand that our experiences are not the same and that trying to force us to imagine ourselves into another person's shoes, is that can actually be quite a violent act because it can vacuum out the subject position of the person who is the target of this exercise and it also is a one-way looking activity. So what interesting VR experiments do is that they allow some kind of interaction or like mutual looking to happen between the traditional seer and the traditional scene and that there is some kind of way for the yeah for multiple users to coexist and interact in that space and like early vr evangelists were really adamant that what they wanted vr to be able to do was to connect people to be able to interact rather than to allow us to experience them and i guess your question was about sort of like that not just being a somatic or a psychological or psychiatric set of experiences or possibilities but that they're are real politics at play here. And, and I totally agree. I mean, in the way that we construct the suffering other, I mean, that is kind of a fundamental way that we define ourselves, I guess. I think it also touches upon a discussion that I've had at this point with more people than I can count. And I'm sure you'll have had a couple of times as well, asking the question of why it is that in left-wing spaces, there tend to be so many people who are depressed, who are anxious, who are angry. And oftentimes very, very, very justifiably, as you put it in your discussion of melancholia, maybe the correct response to the sorts of scenarios that we're facing right now in our near future is kind of maybe not inoperative resignation, but some kind of feeling of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And there is a flip side to that same question. Of course, we can ask, why is it that left-wing people by and large tend to be so sad and angry, <laughs> right? But it's not- You could I check the causality, I guess. Yeah. I think it's also a very similar question to ask. Maybe you've had discussions with friends to a similar effect of you go into a restaurant and you see someone come in and they order something from the barista, from the front of house, whomever, and they're just rude about it. And you think to yourself, yeah, I can tell that you've never worked a real job in your life because if you had, you would know that that's a horrible way to treat another human being. Mm -hmm. And like, I've been working in the service industry my whole life, apart from a couple of months where I was a nurse. But there's a, another consideration there, which is that although right now, it seems like lack of knowledge, lack of understanding seems to contribute to a lot of callous attitudes among people. Ultimately, the service industry is a wreck and no <laughs> one should have to work in it to have that kind of understanding. True. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not like, yeah, it's like abolish debt. Don't just like, <laughs> don't 
create merit based on the fact that one could work oneself out of debt. Yeah, I I know what you mean. I mean, I think Mark Fisher is um, the great guru of why we're all mentally ill under capitalism. And he's very good at saying like, look, this is not, this is not an illogical response. Any empathetic being would be in a state of distress, not to take any kind of individual or biological component away from mental health stuff entirely. There's a really great article in the New York Times of all places today by someone named Danielle Carr about how the quote unquote mental health crisis in America is not a crisis at all. It's like the crisis <laughs> is something else <laughs> and mental health is the consequence and that there's kind of this initiative in the U.S. now to address the supposedly COVID instigated mental health crisis by like making more suicide hotlines and stuff like that. When as we are perfectly aware of like the reasons people are miserable are not because they don't have a suicide hotline, it's because they're in extreme dire circumstances that are structural. And yeah, Danielle makes the case that you can the, these are the only measures being passed because they're the only things that are agreeable across the political spectrum. But of course yeah, we can talk a lot about, there's a great book by Rachel Aviv that has just come out called Strangers to Ourselves. That's about like the bizarre conditioning that receiving a psychiatric diagnosis can give someone. And when in, when in fact, often crazy people are telling you exactly what's happening to them and exactly why. <laughs> you know, Like it's completely clear why somebody might be suffering, but their reaction to it is deemed like, I guess, like incorrect. It reminds me of a, a conversation I had with a mental health nurse up in Edinburgh who tended to work with a lot of families from the outskirts of the city that were, were very, very poor and grew up and come from backgrounds of horrific scarcity. And he commented to me that a lot of the patients that he has aren't people who come to him because they need therapy or psychiatric help. When it gets down to it, the problem is that they need money. <laughs> yeah, they just need money. Totally. Yeah, it's like... Like, you know, that TV show Queer Eye, <laughs> where they come and they give somebody a makeover and a life coach and they fix their house. And it's like the lesson of that show is not like, <laughs> it's, it's like really people, if they just had like enough money to like have a therapist and pay their rent, like they probably would not be in like dire social and psychological states. <laughs> and that like the best mechanism we have for giving people for like, you know, circulating resources is reality TV. Mm -hmm. Well, in relation to all that, this will be the last question, I swear. I know we're nearing on the hour mark. It seems like you and I come from a pretty similar perspective, maybe one broadly influenced by what's called the anti-psychiatry movement. I know you talk about Lane quite a bit in it, a fascinating figure who I find very inspirational. But you, you draw this distinction, I think you get it from someone else, but I can't quite remember, between paranoid reading and, and reparative reading. Mm -hmm. The purpose yeah, of that that's, is that... Um... Paranoid reading seems to be, seems to fail by picking out a single cause to a problem and expecting some kind of universal solution to it. Mm -hmm. And I guess my worry is if we do away with that, what resources are we left with to pointing out the systemic causes of mental health issues and things like that? Yeah, it's a really good question. The paranoid versus reparative reading comes from Eve Kosovsky Sedgwick, who wrote an essay called that, Paranoid and Reparative Reading or something. And I really like her emphasis that, like, like she uses this idea of the way that you read a text as a way of talking about how people read the world or try to decode the world. And this idea that a lot of people have that is totally relatable. Like I always say being a conspiracy theorist is totally relatable. There's nothing wrong with you because life is a conspiracy. Like the conspiratorial actors are completely visible. The problem is when you begin looking for the conspiratorial actors who are not visible <laughs> because there are so many that are right on the surface. Like it just like, it doesn't really take much, you know, digging to find out what's wrong and who's pulling the strings. It's like, we're perfectly aware. So I guess this idea of paranoid reading is the desire to take control of the narrative by always knowing that there's something else to uncover and that you will be the one to uncover it and that there will be a great reveal or you know some kind of revelation at which point it will finally become clear who the culprit is and who's pulling the strings of reality or whatever. And reparative reading, on the other hand, is a kind of reading that makes connections, like sutures together 
ideas, tries to make sense of things as they are, rather than try to rip them back to, you know, reveal what is within. And I think that's useful when talking about the way that critique works in our current political and economic system. It's like, I, I, I think less and less about critique as like a prying open or like a, you know, like a digging down, looking for something and like, you know, like Susan Sontag also has a lot to say about like, don't read like a paranoiac who can get to the bottom of the text. <laughs> like there is no bottom of the text. The text is, you know, it's multiple, it's, it's like it exists in multiple dimensions or something. So yeah, I guess like a reparative reading is taking at face value what's there. And I think that's, that's really, that's a really hard strategy. Like it's hard to read the world as it is. It's actually in some ways easier to imagine that there is something to be uncovered constantly into perpetuity. And actually, if we tried to deal with what's completely visible, <laughs> we'd be doing a lot already. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're just about done. So I wanted to ask you if you have any final comments for any of our listeners. And if you could maybe tell us about any projects you're working on at the moment, or if you have anything else coming up. Sure. I can't think of anything that we've missed. This has been wonderfully comprehensive. Hopefully not there's, tiresomely so. No, there's always more to talk about. <laughs> we didn't talk about live action role play and we didn't talk about like medieval manuscripts, but I think that people should get the book and find out what I'm talking about themselves. And at the moment I am working on some short form writing for magazines and I'm trying to write a new novel, which is challenging and it's, it's pandemic inspired, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, I look forward to reading it. Good luck with your new book. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Take care. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.